let's let's take a case and 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 talk about well before we go to a case let's talk about second line therapy i think uh, you've done a great job talking about frontline therapy so now let's move on and take a look at the evidence for second line therapy in metastatic uh, kidney cancer we have three trials we have serafinib as second line therapy we have Brian, your, your trial with axitinib in second line, and we ob obviously have record one. So let's start, Monty, with how do you think about second line therapy in relationship to frontline treatment, and then how do you make your decisions, and how would you recommend those decisions be made? Because we have multiple agents in that setting, FDA approved. How do you make a decision? Right, so if, if we're talking about the most common patient type who's progressed on VEGF-directed therapy in the frontline setting, I think it really requires a deep dive of the data. You know, in, in Brian's trial, uh, the uh, benefit of exitinib over serafinib was very clear. Um, it, however, I, I do think that if you break down the patient populations into those pretreated with cytokines versus those who received VEGF-directed ther therapy up front or, or other targeted agents, you do see some discrepancy in terms of the PFS with exitinib, perhaps closer to five months um, in the uh, group pretreated with sinitinib. Um, if we look at record one and specifically hone in on the subpopulation of patients that had gotten one prior TKI, there again the PFS comes out to close to five months. Uh, so with a balanced PFS between those two regimens, to me the question turns to toxicity. Um, and based on my own experience, uh, and I, I feel that this might be somewhat consistent with the published data, uh, it does seem to me as though Everolimus may have a favorable toxicity profile in that setting. It offers a bit of a break from VEGF-directed therapy. So uh, I tend to switch to Everolimus uh, fairly consistently uh, in the second-line setting. I know there are different opinions on the panel. Dan, how do you approach this? Yeah, you know, I guess I'm a little bit more mixed on this one. And, uh, what, you know, I look at, um, for right or for wrong, I look at the frontline uh, response therapy and, importantly, duration of response. If I've got a patient that has gotten a good response and, and durable response to their frontline VEGF inhibitor and maybe now has some more chronic cumulative toxicity, maybe there's been some dose reductions or delays, that's a patient that I'm probably thinking more of a second-line VEGF inhibitor like exitinib particularly if that progression is more of growing existing lesions and less new lesions. That's a patient, again, where maybe it's not an absolute refractory uh, biology to VEGF, and, uh, and I'm going to try them on, on another VEGF inhibitor. I like exitinib because uh, it's a twice-a-day medicine, uh, so it's giving you different pharmacokinetics. Uh, it's got a quicker washout when we do run into toxicity problems. It gives us more flexibility on the dosing, both up and down. So there's a lot of advantages to that uh, in terms of it as a second-line agent and what we can do with that versus our frontline uh, VEGF inhibitors. Now, when I have a patient that has, on the other hand, more rapid progression in that frontline VEGF setting, uh, say on sinitinib within three months, within six months, has clear progression, new lesions, uh, and, and, uh, or symptomatic progression, that's a situation where I'm more leaning towards an mTOR inhibitor in that second-line setting because there are some histologies out there we're beginning to recognize genetic underlying uh, differences uh, where some patients may have uh, you know, driver biology that's more down the mTOR PI3 kinase pathways. And for those patients, I want to make sure we get them an mTOR inhibitor while they can still handle it. So, so I, I'm torn here. I'm not sure there's a clear answer one way or the other. Probably if I look at my practice, 75% are going on to a second-line VEGF inhibitor, 25% are switching to mTOR. But I, you know, I, I think it's fluid, and I'm, and I'm not sure my academic practice is the same as the community's. So I think at the end of the day, I kind of weigh a number of these factors and, and sort of and discuss them with the patients. Ideally, I'm really looking to try to get patients through both lines of therapy. I think there's benefit to both, both lines, another VEGF inhibitor and an mTOR inhibitor. So Brian, what's the right answer? <clears throat> so I'm going to disagree with my colleagues a little bit, and I, I obviously have a biased opinion because I was very involved with exitinib's development. I mean, to me, it comes down to the biology of the disease. Just like prostate cancer is hormonally driven, kidney cancer is VEGF driven, and it doesn't stop becoming VEGF driven after sunitinib or pazopinib. Uh, it's fun that's just the fundamental biology of the disease. Um, I think, you know, Dan mentioned something I think is very common, saying, well, gee, if they responded to frontline VEGF, then we should put them on a second-line VEGF except that there's no data that supports that. All of the retrospective data would suggest, and it's retrospective, so it's limited, that it really doesn't matter. It doesn't make sense, right? If a patient has primary refractory disease to VEGF, you want to switch them. The patient wants to be switched. It doesn't, patients don't, don't take it well when you say, well, I'm going to give you a drug that's kind of similar to what you just got. 
But again, the data is the data, and all the data would suggest that it re those, those really aren't correlated. Can I just, let me just interrupt for a second. Do you think the Interact data, you know, where it was second line right. post TKI, TEM versus serafinib, ran, where, where you start to pick at those that had longer responses to a prior TKI versus those that had shorter, helps you answer that question? Well, I think I, I was going to get to that trial. I mean, to me, it, it although the, the, there were some imperfections in trial and data collection about subsequent therapy, to me, it only reinforces that when patients get have failed sunitinib, when they get another VEGF therapy, they live longer. And at the end of the day, we're not curing people, so we're trying to make them live longer. And I realize that data is imperfect, but again, it's a four and a half month survival advantage to getting a VEGF second line over an mTOR in that setting. So, so, I, th so I, think, I think that, and we'll come back with some specific cases, but I, I think it again illustrates an unmet need where we have multiple agents, second line setting, different populations, different designs, uh, no real head-to-head -head comparisons that answer it for us, and we're having to make qualitative decisions on an individual basis until such data really comes into our practice.